But it's amazing to see the look on your kids' faces on Christmas week, right? It's amazing, the look on their face. I mean, they get so excited because it's Christmas week, and they know what that means. They know what that means. That means they're going to be able to open presents and all this kind of stuff. And, of course, Santa's going to show up or whatever, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, but we homeschool our daughter. So for us, it was even, even more kind of amazing to see the whole, the whole process because we homeschool. So we enjoy that time off as a teacher and everything else even more, you know, to, just to be able to sit and to kind of have a great week with our kids and see the excitement of them not having to go to, to school and do the homeschooling and stuff. So it, it's, it's interesting. And you know what else amazes me is it doesn't matter how much we tell our kids the true meaning of Christmas, they still just get so excited about opening the gifts and everything. And, and you know, Stephanie can tell us the Christmas story. She can tell us what it's all about and all that kind of stuff. But still, there's nothing like kids getting down and ripping their presents open and all this kind of stuff. And we talked about that last week. We kind of talked about the greatest Christmas gift ever and what that's all about. And that's amazing. Um, but now that Christmas is over and this whole week has kind of passed us, now we've got to think of what's coming up, right? What's coming up now? A whole new year. A whole new year. So with the new year in front of us, what does that mean to you? I mean, what, what do you start to think when you think of a new year? You start thinking of all the new possibilities and, and all the new challenges that are going to face you and all the obstacles that will come your way and how you're going to come, you know, just go over these obstacles and how you're going to overcome all this, right? And so it's amazing. And we've been talking about what? CrossFit, right? We've been talking a lot about this and the benefits of starting a new year off with CrossFit and what that's all about. And, you know, kind of, we talked a little bit about that quite a bit. But, you know, some of you, if you decide to do that, it may be a new tradition for you. It may be new in your home. You may be, it may be something new that you're not familiar with. Maybe you don't read scriptures every single day or pray every single day. So maybe if you could start it in that, it'll start new traditions for you. Maybe not. It may not start any new traditions. You may already do all three of those. You may, you know, do, be, be involved in fitness of your own. Um, you may be involved in, in scripture reading and, and prayer each day with your family and all this kind of stuff. So you can, you could possibly already be involved in all of this. But you know, this is, as I was thinking about this, I started writing down and I started writing that this is a tough part for a pastor, a tough part of the year for a pastor, because now Christmas and Thanksgiving's over and all this kind of stuff. But actually, in all reality, it's a great season for a pastor. See, oftentimes we can look at the glass half empty, or we can look at the glass half full. It just depends on how we want to look at it. But really, it can be a great year for a pastor right now, a great season for a pastor. Why is that? Because we are going to start a new year. And so this is a great time for families to really strengthen their family relationships and the dynamics in their home. It's a great time for people to make new resolutions and to start a new year fresh and to start different and to maybe make improvements, right? How many of us this year have decided we want to, to, to go down a notch this year and not improve at all? Right? None of us want to do that, right? So we all want to improve. So we all want to bring our lives to a higher standard and to, and to do something with our lives this year. So this can be a great time for a pastor to be able to lead their sheep and to kind of encourage it and to bring the, um, you know, to help the people find ways to improve their lifestyle and their habits. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. That's something we're going to talk a little bit about. And I hope that through this, you'll kind of find encouragement about your life into the new year. How many of you were here last year? I think there's only one in this room that was here last year. We talked about soaring into 2015. Do you remember that? About the eagle and how an eagle likes to soar? This year I kind of changed it up. We're going to talk about pouring into 2016. So it's kind of the same. Soaring into 2016. This one's pouring into 2016. And, and I, I was kind of asking God for something new and fresh like I always do. And God never, ever fails. So he really kind of delivered in a big way. A lot of times you hear people talking all the time about the Old Testament being so far back and things like this, but I want to dig up something from the Old Testament that I think will really help us and give us something we can apply to our lives, something new, something fresh, and something exciting that we can kind of carry with us. So then we're going to look at 2 Kings today, chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, you may want to turn to that. I'm going to read this. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk about this a little bit. But as we go to look at this, as you're making your way there, how many of you feel like we spend entirely too much time being focused on what the outside of our bodies look like? Mm -hmm. Right? 
In America, that's what it's all about. You see billboards everywhere, and they talk about how sex sells and all this kind of stuff and everything. And, and, and you know, so we, we focus so much on the outside. And then when we look at the world, how many of you have seen War Room yet? How many of you have seen it? Just two hands, a couple, a few more people. War Room is an awesome movie because they start to really talk about what we're really supposed to be focused on. Where the real war and the real battle is raged. And it's so important because I think we've lost track of that. We get so caught up in how nice our car is or how nice we are or how fancy we can dress or how much better we are than the ones around us and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and that causes so much confusion. What is that? That's the battle Satan wants us to fight, see? And so he gets us caught up in this, and the world sees that, and they know that. And it's kind of like this little snare trap that he lays all over the place. Recently on social media, I saw something that really caught my attention. I thought this was amazing. How many mothers do we have in here? See, and, and so this is really going to hit home. Fathers, pay attention and listen to this. There was a woman on social media that posted a picture of herself, and she wasn't really sure if she should. And, but she posted anyway, it showed her stomach, stretch marks and all, right? And, and so she got a, a real negative response at the beginning. She, I mean, just people started saying all kinds of nasty things about it, like you should cover that up and all this kind of stuff. But her husband came to her defense so quickly. And he said, you want to know something? Every time I see her beauty... It reminds me of everything we've come through as a family. All the things that she's done and all this kind of stuff. And, and these are stripes that she's earned. And, and it makes her more beautiful, in my opinion, because I see everything she's gone through to bring my family about. And it was amazing. It was incredible. Well, then she starts, she goes back because in the beginning it really brought her down. You can imagine how that hurts. And so later on, you know, she goes back and she posts, you know, how, how that's true. She's so proud of the stripes that she's earned. They're not marks, they're stripes that she's earned in delivering her children. Does that make sense? And so what took place was amazing as a result of this. How many of you have seen this thing shared around on Facebook and stuff? So this is what happens after this. She inspired so many people to post pictures just like that. Other women posting pictures of, of their stretch marks they earned. Military veterans posting pictures of their arms where their arm, they lost their arm or their legs showing pictures of their scars. And, and you know, other people showing, you know, children showing pictures. I saw them. I was like looking at this. I'm amazed by this. Showing pictures of burn scars that they had as children that were left on their flesh and stuff like that. And, and so it inspired a lot of people to think outside the box. Why are we allowing the world to dictate who we are? And to tell us what we can and cannot be. And so it was amazing. And as I got to look at that, I, I thought, wow, how much we get caught up on what on the outside. And here's the thing. If we're not careful what will happen, this is exactly what will happen. How would you like to get, you know, how many of you got presents for Christmas this year? Probably a few. More than, more than we probably should sometimes and more than we deserve, right? But it's amazing because God blesses us. Well, how would you like if you got this one present that was just a bit, it was a nice size box and it, it was wrapped so nice and it looked amazing. So you go through and you open all your presents and you hold that one to the last, right? Because you think that's probably the best one. And then you open this box and it's empty. It's a fancy box, but it's empty on the inside. See, if we're not careful and we focus too much on the outside, what will happen is we'll end up shallow and empty on the inside. Very good. And so I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about something very, very important. And I want you guys to get this. I want you to really understand this as we look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 2 Kings 4, 1 through 6 really lays it out. It says, And now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets to Elisha, saying, we got to understand this. I'm going to go back and cover this whole verse. Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creator is come to take him, to, I mean the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. Well, I'm going to cover this first verse because everything hinge pins on this first verse. We really got to understand what's going on. It says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, So this woman comes to Elisha. And, and she was um, a child of a prophet and all this kind of stuff. She was involved in the families of these prophets. And, um, and she cries unto Elisha. 
And this is what she says to him. My ser thy servant, my husband, is dead. My husband that used to serve you for the income for our family is now dead. So the income that was coming into our family is gone. He's no longer able to serve you. So there's no way to pay off what we owe. And so then it goes, continues on to say, And now knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. So here's what's taking place. Because of this, as a result, what would happen back in Bible times and things like that and back in these scriptural times is that if you couldn't pay a debt, then they would come and make you a servant. And you would become a slave of these people. We've talked about this many times through different passages. And so if you couldn't pay your debt or whatever, then you would work to work off you know, your time. You know, we've seen people do this with their, with their spouses and stuff in scripture and all kinds of stuff. They would spend time working under Laban, and we've seen that before, and all this kind of stuff in order to pay off debts that they owed. And so this would happen. Well, if you couldn't pay your debt, then what they would do is come take your children and enslave them. And so that's the situation that she's in right here. Now let's continue reading now that we kind of laid the footwork. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in your house, or what do you have? And she says, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, Go borrow, understand that word, the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, as it means get as many as you can get. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So what I want you to do is just pour into these vessels, and just keep pouring in until they're full, and then set them aside. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and her sons, and brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, <coughs> that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed or stopped flowing. I want you to understand there's, there's so many things to look at from this passage of Scripture. I could spend weeks on this one passage of Scripture, but bear with me because I'm going to try to cover all this and make it in a way that will make sense to all of you. So, so here's the thing. That the first thing we need to understand about this whole thing is this woman is in a very desperate situation. How would you like for someone to come in your home and already be knocking on the door saying, we want your kids? Because your husband's passed away, so he can't pay off the debt that he owes, so we want your kids, right? And that's the situation that she's in. And so she has, you know, she goes, well, what does she do? What's the most important thing that she did right here? It's amazing what she does. She knows the solution is through God. And so she goes to a prophet sent here by God and speaks with him. And she, she knows where to go, and she talks to him, and she says, what, what should I do? What do I need to do? She's in this desperate situation. She needs a miracle. She needs a miracle to take place. How many of you today need a miracle in your life right now? I mean, seriously. I mean, I think we can all relate to this. I mean, we would love to have a breakthrough. God has a breakthrough in store for you in 2016, and you can believe it, and it's got your name on it. Um, so, so she knows that she needs something to happen, and, and she needs a miracle. She needs something to take place. So she goes to this anointed man of God, and she says, I need something. I just don't know what to do. And what he says to her is amazing. He gives this incredible response. He says, he, he says I only have one question for you. What is inside your house? Not what's outside, not what's going on in the world, not, not, not anything else. All he said is, what do you have inside your house? Notice he didn't start looking for qualifications. He didn't say, what are you qualified in? What are your abilities? What are your talents? Can you sing music? Can, can you play music? Can you, can you do this? Can you do that? He didn't ask for any of that. Because God doesn't look for talents and abilities. God gives you the talents and abilities that you need. What he said is, what do you have inside your house? The amazing thing we can understand from this is you already have everything you need, and so did she for God to work a miracle. Because God doesn't need anything. When, when they needed money, what did, what did God do when they had to pay taxes? And, and so it was time to pay taxes. Did Jesus need to pay taxes? No. But he decided to anyway. And how did they get the money? In the mouth of a fish. So when God says, when, when God needs something, he, he doesn't need anything to work a miracle. All he needs is a willing vessel, someone that's willing to step up and to step out. So he didn't ask for her talents or her abilities or experience or qualifications or anything. He just said, what's in your home? I want you to see something today. 
all she needed for a God to do a miracle was to be a willing vessel for God to work through her. And that's all she needed. Um, I want you to visualize something for a second. I want you to visualize a full container. Something completely full to the top. If you have something that's completely full, but you want more, how do you get more? Either two things. Either grow or empty yourself out so you can be filled up again. If it's completely full, there's nothing you can do with it. I planned on, and actually the funny thing is, I can't believe I did this. I had a container sitting at home that was full that I was planning on bringing in as an object lesson so you can actually see this. But you're going to have to visualize this whole thing. So, so if, if it's full, what's the problem here? So it's completely full, but you don't want to use it. So what's the problem? It's not a blessing to anyone or, or anything around you. If there's something completely full but you don't want to use it and you have it and it looks great and you're like, that is so nice. You know, you were talking about your son had Christmas gifts that he didn't even open yet because he didn't want to use them yet or didn't want to get them dirty and all this stuff. What good are they? You bought these gifts last year that haven't even been used yet. So, so they're not a blessing to anyone. No one can use them. No one can touch them because they look so good right there in their package. And so I don't want to use it. So the problem is it's worthless to anyone around them or to themselves. You ever know someone that hoards stuff all the time and they have all this stuff that they can't even use and it's just sitting there and it's worthless to anyone? Whereas if they would just go open it up and allow people to use it, it would be worth so much to people. See, God gives us things and he wants for us to use them. You ever had something in your kitchen, you know, you're cooking, maybe you're making spaghetti. This would be a good one too, right? You're making spaghetti and you got everything, you got the noodles finally cooked up. You go and grab the, the container of ragu and you try to pop the top and it won't come off. You can't get it off. And so your, your noodles are in there and they're getting soggy and you're like, I don't want them to get soggy. I mean, I, I don't want them to get overdone. And so you're trying to get this lid off, but you can't get it off. What's the problem? The problem is you've got this nice container, but it's worthless, and it'll cause waste around you if you don't get the top off. So see, there's some value to these things inside, but it's what's inside of that container that you need to get to. And if you can't reach what's inside of something, it can sometimes be pretty worthless. It can sometimes be pretty worthless. So it's only if we are willing to be used by God that we will become valuable to God and to those around us. See, God wants to use you in 2016, but you have to be available and be willing to allow him to use you. He's instilled in each one of us today. How many of you believe this? He's instilled in each one of us today a certain gift and a certain talent to be used by him, and we need to make those talents and things available. So a guy came to me the other day, and he says, you don't understand. As a matter of fact, the lady was talking to me about being in church this Sunday. I'm kind of surprised she didn't show up because we had a great, great conversation. But she says, you know, Pastor, there's something I want to tell you, though. I'm worthless to God. No, that is so incorrect. And we had this amazing conversation as a result. Sat down, I paid for her lunch, and we had a great conversation. And I said, the thing you need to understand is right where you are, you are so valuable. How many of you went over and saw Brian um, Zitt's speech it, it, when he talked about his addictions and things over at the other church we went to, over at Grace Point? And he talked about all his addictions and all this kind of stuff. Do you know he's brought so many people to Christ as a result of his experience? He could have easily said, I'm worthless to God. I've been addicted to drugs. I've laid in so many ditches. I've had needles hanging out of my arm. I'm worthless to God. But instead, he realized that it doesn't matter what other people see in him. It's what God sees in him and what God's put into him that makes the difference. And that's amazing. So that brings us to the next point. Elisha's prophet, he said, go find other vessels to pour into. What I need for you to do is I need you to find other vessels to pour into. That's the most important thing. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to borrow a few. I want you to borrow as many vessels as you can possibly find to pour into. And so Elisha says, what, what I need for you to do is I just need you to go get these vessels and bring them back in and close the door on yourself and on your sons so I can work a miracle. How many of you know that sometimes it's important that we get alone with God in order to see God work out a miracle? Sometimes you'll see, you'll have the world be pulling at you from every angle. I love War Room because it's a, it's, it's a simple idea. Create a room, get rid of all the distractions, and go in there and worship God without any distractions. It's kind of amazing 
how much better that makes it when you do something like that. You know, and when I watched it, I thought, well, we don't really need to have a prayer room to really have a war room with God. You know, we can make our house our war room, right? How many of you have made your house your war room already? And you've prayed in your house so many times, and, and it's just been an amazing place of battle, right? But, but, the, but the thing is, sometimes your, your cell phone will go off, or, or something will pop on the TV, or somebody will bang on the door. And, all, and so Satan tries to make all these distractions to pull you away. So sometimes having that little quiet space can be important, and I agree with that. At the same time, you can really have a war room anywhere you want to have it. I mean, you can have a war room in a busy dining restaurant if you wanted to. But, it, but the amazing thing is sometimes the world tries to make this distraction. So he says, go in and close the door to yourself. God's getting ready to do something for you. And get a whole bunch of vessels because God's getting ready to send something out and it's going to be incredible. And so the point here is, the Elisha says, go get as many vessels you, as you can possibly get. So here's the thing I need for you to understand. This is the next thing you need to understand from this is that she determined the magnitude of her miracle and not God. <laughs> Why is that? See, sometimes we get caught up on that and we say, you know, God determines the magnitude of your miracle. Not always. Here's the thing that we need to understand about God. What, what do you think of when you think of God? What are the things you think of? What are the attributes of God you think of? Omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I mean, everything you think of God is limitless. Why would we think his miracles are limitless for you? Or his blessings are limited for you? Amen. They're only limited by you. You're the only one that stands in your way. God said, go get as many vessels as you can find that are empty and that are ready to be filled. <coughs> and, and you just stand back and watch me. But I'll only fill as many as there's room to fill. So you determine the magnitude of the miracle God's going to work through you. So, so the prophet said, just go get as many as you can possibly get. And this woman, she went and she got a whole bunch of them. And, and it, it, the thing that we see here is heaven has this unlimited supply. And it's limitless. And so the only thing that it was a problem is God just needed a vessel to pour into to work this miracle out. So once there were vessels to pour into, what took place? Once she had empty vessels that were ready to be used, what happened? That's when she began to pour. And she began to pour. And she poured and continued to pour and continued to pour. And the oil continued to flow and continued to flow and continued to flow. And the oil just kept on flowing and kept on flowing out of one container. How does this happen? Like the container was already half empty. She had been using it, right? And so as she's pouring, it just keeps filling up containers. And she's sending them to the side, sending them to the side, and sending them to the, to the side. And when did the oil stop flowing? When she ran out of vessels. When there was no more vessels for her to flow into, for that, for that oil to flow into. So as long as there were clean, empty vessels that she could use, she just, it just continued and continued and continued to pour and to pour and to pour and to pour into it. Remember the Christmas box that was wrapped that was all fancy we talked about that was empty? Mm -hmm. What is that box worth to you? What's it worth? Not much. Two to three dollars, maybe? How much would you pay for a box to wrap your presents in? Maybe a dollar? Two dollars? So, so the box isn't really worth anything to us. Maybe it's worth two to three dollars, if that. It really has no value at all. The box has no value. That's what I need for us to understand here today. The box doesn't really have any value at all. It's maybe a couple dollars and that's it. But the box takes on a tremendous value based off of what's placed inside the box. That's when the box gets so much value. Does this make sense? It's kind of like anything else. Like, how many of you have ever had somebody deliver something to you at your work or at home and all this kind of stuff and it's got a nice box wrapped around it and, and they got a cold or something, they got the flu and they show up at your door to deliver this and they hand it to you, right? And you're so glad that box is on there. Why? Because it protected everything inside and everything else, right? So sometimes even though that little $2 box may not be that big, it'll still protect everything on the inside. Right? So sometimes a box that's not worth very much can take on tremendous value. What if someone delivered food to you? 
You know, maybe a pizza or something. And, you're, and then they just show up with this pizza in their hand and the cheese is all running down all over them. Like, I mean, that's gross, right? You don't even want that at that point. You don't even want this thing. But that's why they put it in a box. A, a simple little couple dollar box is worth a lot sometimes when it's not even worth but about two to three dollars. But it takes on tremendous value based on what's put inside of it. You know, the box, right? You, you think about this box again. It's got this fancy wrapping paper on it and curling ribbon, kind of like what we've done back there with these you know, pictures and stuff on the wall. It's got fancy curling ribbon on it and all this kind of stuff and a big fancy bow and all this. What's all that worth to you? If I was to pull that curling ribbon off and do an auction for it in this room, how much do you think would be the highest you could sell for? It could look fancy and it could look great but it's not worth much at all. So now remember something that's important. There was an important word that was said before. Um, what did she do when she went to get these containers? It says she borrowed them. Okay. Remember I said it, and I said that was going to be an important word, and we come back to that later on. She borrowed these things. She borrowed these extra pots. Here's the reason, and we need to understand this. Why would God give us this object lesson for something for us to remember later on? Why is it so important that she borrowed these containers? Because the oil was never meant to stay inside in the first place. The oil was never meant to stay inside the containers. He says, go borrow these containers, as many as you can get, and fill them with oil. But don't just leave them sit in there. The oil's worthless if you let it sit in these containers. Just borrow them. And when you're done, take them back because you're not going to be keeping them very long. You know, Jesus Christ, we just looked at this last week, demonstrated this so perfectly. How did Christ demonstrate something borrowed? Here's the way he demonstrated the value between borrowing and purchasing. Jesus Christ borrowed a tomb from Joseph of Arimathea. Why did he borrow it? Because he knew the tomb could not keep him. The grave could not keep him. But he bought you and you and you, each one of us, he purchased with his own blood for a lifetime, for an eternity, he's purchased you. That's the difference. See, Jesus knew the difference between borrowing and, and buying and purchasing. And so he makes this point here very well. He says, go borrow these containers. They're not going to be worth anything to you later on. Give them back. Just borrow them for a while. Because what you're going to receive, you have to give away. And so that's amazing. Amen. Now here's the thing to understand. Oil in these times, you've got to think. What was probably the most valuable thing you could have at this time? Oil. Oil was extremely valuable. Now gold is valuable too, and it's always been. But can you take a, a gold cube or anything like that and light it and burn it and make fire or anything with it? No, but you can trade for some things, right? But if you had oil, just think of all the things you could do with oil in the scripture times, in Bible times. Because I got to looking at this, and I, I started going through the scriptures trying to find places where oil was used. And it's amazing what oil was used for. And a lot of these uses we still have today. It was used to store and to cook food. Oil was used to store and to cook food. We still use oil today to cook our food in. And if you ever seen those fancy little vases that people have on their counter that has like olives and all these fancy little things in them, right? And what's in there? It's oil or water. Sometimes it's water. But what happens if you take the top off and pour all the liquid out but keep that and set it right there on the counter for very long? It'll shrivel up. And it's not going to look very nice very long. So see, they started using oil. They understood something. Oil would be great for storing and for cooking with. You could use it for both. It was also great, a commodity for exchange. If you look all through Scripture, it was used as a commodity of exchange. Um, it was used for cosmetics. It's still used in cosmetics today. It's, it was used in medicine to heal and, and to do all kinds of things for medicine. But one of the most amazing things is it was used as a light source. See, they didn't have this thing we have now where you just flip the light on and the lights come on. They didn't have that. So what they had to do was they would have little, little oil lanterns and they would use these oil lanterns as their lights all the time. That's the only light they had. So at nighttime, if you needed to move through the house, you got one of those and you walked through that. Oil was used for so much. In addition to that look in your scriptures, it was used for anointing for, for several different reasons. It was used for personal healing and spiritual healing. And, and when I say that physical healing, what I mean is sometimes if you had a physical illness, 
You know, someone would anoint you with oil for your physical ailments, right? But then also there was this spiritual thing as well, where they would sometimes anoint you with oil for spiritual healing. So it served a lot of purposes in Scripture that are backed up in Scripture. Um, so, so what she had here was something that was ex of extreme value. But the problem was it's just like that jar in your kitchen. If you can't get the top off or if you can't use it, it's a whole lot of money in a bottle that's worth nothing to anyone. And see, here's the thing that we need to understand. The only thing that stood between her sons becoming slaves and their freedom was a little bit of oil. Just a little bit of oil. And so she needed to be able to use this oil. You can't bless others. You know, when God puts something inside of you, it's so you can use it to bless, to bless others, to pour those blessings out. And, and so you can't be a blessing to others if you take all the blessings that God gives you and lock them up inside of you. If you take all the blessings and all the benefits and everything else that God gives you and you just lock them up inside of you, what are you worth? Worth absolutely nothing. What does Christ talk about us all the time when he talks about what he did? He talks about we're the vine and he is the branch, right? And so he flo the, everything of God flows up into us as a branch. What do you think of when you think of a vine? What's the first thing you think of? Grapes. They grow on a vine, right? What do you think of if you see a barren grapevine, right? Are you going to spend much time around that barren grapevine? No. It's worthless. You'll chop it off and throw it in the fire, just like it says in Scripture. But as long as that vine is flowing and you have all these grapes, what is it worth to you now? It's worth nourishment and everything else. And you can go there and pick those grapes, in, and they're so good, and the juice flows out of them. You can make juice and all kinds of stuff out of them, right? So then it becomes a great value to everyone. You want to be around people that are showing the fruits of God in their lives. That's who you want to be around. Because you can draw nourishment and everything from them. If they're hiding all the gifts of God inside, they're like a dried up grapevine. Worthless. You can't pluck any grapes off, so you can't get anything out of it. So to you, you're just like, there's another dried up grapevine. I think I'll go over here and stand next to someone that's producing some fruit in their life. See, God wants you to produce some fruit. He wants you to take the fruit and everything that he's given you and to allow others access to these gifts that he's given to each one of us. And that's the only way that we can use, that God can use us to our maximum. So, God wants us to use all these things that he's given us. He's pouring out all this stuff inside of us. And the thing that we need to understand is he'll continue and continue and continue to pour out as long as we'll, we'll be a willing vessel and pour those things into other people. You know, the thing is, we're just a vessel and Christ is in us. And until we understand that we've lost the battle, it's no different than the, the lady in war room. She fought and fought and fought. How many of you feel like you're fighting every day and you feel like the battle is just, you know, sometimes you just feel like you're losing the battle. If we started to fight the battle correctly, see, we would sometimes realize that there's a battle going on and we're going to fight constantly, but we know who our victor is and we know where the victory lies. And, and even though sometimes we may not see the full picture during our lifetime, we know that we can stand before God and see it all spread out. And one day we'll, we'll see the victory. It's amazing, and that's what we need to do. You know, we're just the best when Christ is in us. We shouldn't get all puffed up when God starts using us either. See, sometimes that'll happen, and we'll get all puffed up. But then we need to step back and start to realize we're nothing but a fancy $2 box. Amen. It's God inside of us that gives us our value. Amen. And so if we're trying to be all puffed up when God tries to use us, all we're being is a fancy little box that's worth $2. God's doing all the work. Just get out of the way and let him do it. You're just a fancy little vessel and that's it. And God's working through you to do all the things that he wants to accomplish. Amen. That's really good. And that brings us to our final point. How many of you know that we need to be empty in order to be used by God? Amen. I mean, in order to be filled up, you have got to be empty. You have got to be empty in order for God to, to fill you back up again. If you're already full and God starts pouring into the top of you, what's going to happen? If you're not empty, you're just going to overflow. And the blessings are going to go to other people around you because you're already full. <coughs> You've got the cap screwed on. Nobody can get it off. And God's trying to pour blessings into you. And it's just running off the top of your cap and onto everyone else. And everyone else is getting the blessings that you should be receiving and pouring out. So we need to constantly be ready to be used by God and be emptying ourselves daily of what we have. 
And then we need to be cleaning ourselves up all the time on the inside. It's called regeneration. And we need to constantly be cleaning ourselves on the inside. Now, we've talked about this several times, but what you pour in is what you pour out. If you pour in clean water into a container, how many of you want to drink it? If I pour muddy water in, how many want to drink it now? What you pour into your life is what you'll pour out of your life. So if you want God to bless you and you want, you want to be used by God, then we need to be clean constantly. We need to be constantly cleaning ourselves. How many of you like coffee in here? How many of you love, love to drink some coffee? Right? How many of you would love to go to Dunkin' Donuts and, and you walk up to the line and just as you get there, some customer comes up and places their dirty cup down that they drink out of. And then the, so the lady asks you, what would you like? Oh, I would love like a, a French vanilla iced coffee. Triple extra sugar and some cream in there. Make it really good. So she takes that cup, doesn't wash it out, and goes and starts putting your coffee in and says, there you go, and rings you up for it. How many of you would drink that coffee? <laughs> Never. Never. See, that's the amazing thing. God will use us no matter how we are and what condition we're in. But what God truly wants is a clean vessel that's willing to be used by Him. And so God wants us to constantly be cleaning out our lives. So how do we get our lives clean? How do we clean the vessel in order for God to use it? All by what you pour in. That's what you're going to pour out. See, if we're pouring filth in constantly, we're going to be pouring filth out. But see, if we start pouring clean things in, then it's important. See, some of the things that we can do to get our vessel clean is, first off, we need salvation. Because without salvation, you can't be clean. But once we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, He makes a promise to us through Scripture. And what God can't do is anything against this Word of God. He can't go against His own Word. And what He says is when you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, He will wash you white as snow. All those crimson stains of sin and everything, past, present, future, doesn't matter. He cleans those all up. But then what we need to do is keep ourselves clean by constantly spending time in the Word of God. By constantly spending time in prayer. And by constantly doing all the things that we know that we're supposed to do. It's called living a life that is pure and holy. You know, the New Living Translation, I always use the King James Version, but the New Living Translation really breaks this scripture down. And it's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you that you give your bodies to God as a willing vessel. Because of all that he has done for you, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. This is truly the way to worship God. The true way to worship God is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy. What does holy mean? Perfect. Blameless. Set apart. Holy and acceptable which is our reasonable service or our true way to worship Him. That way we can remain empty and useful for God. What are we going to do with 2016? We have a choice. We can do anything we want to do with 2016. We can walk out of here and say, Oh, I'm going to church this Sunday. I'm going to church so everybody sees it and your family is all like, Oh, great, they're going to church somewhere. So your, your faith in God lies in where you park your car on Sunday. Or you can make your faith in God what it truly is meant to be. Spend time in worship. Spend time in prayer. Constantly be searching out the things of God. And be cleaning your vessel daily so when God pours into you, you're pouring out useful water and replenishment to everyone around you. We can only accomplish these things with prayer, God's word, and taking care of our bodies. Physically, physically and spiritually. What are we going to do with 2016? God's looking for an empty vessel. Yes. 